we're all on a journey. And for many, it can feel like a lonely journey, but it just doesn't have to be that way. As a matter of fact, my guest today says our true journey is to help others on the paths they choose to take. Let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk and hear more about it. A pocket-sized pep talk, the podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jollis. Edia Stanford Bruce is a writer by trade and a storyteller by heart. She earned a BA in journalism, went on to acquire a master's in early childhood education from Rutgers University. She did that 17 years after earning that BA. And, it, and she did her homework side by side with her high school daughter. <laughs> Clearly, that inspired her daughter to work hard as her daughter was her class's valedictorian. She's the author of Fruitivity, Cultivating a Fruitful and Productive Life, Helping Readers to Make an Essential Decision to Live Their Divine Assignment in the Social Forest During Our Life on Earth. Welcome to the show, Edia. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I want to start right where that introduction left off, by the way. Live our divine assignment in the social forest during our life on Earth. Tell me what you mean by that. Essentially, we are not mere cosmic flotsam. Some people have the idea, and you have a right to your opinion, that we're just here. We just appeared. We showed up. In Gone with the Wind, Topsy said, I won't born. I just growed. <laughs> but I don't believe that. I believe we were sent here with a purpose that we were sent here to be part of a network of human beings who were while we were on earth, help one another grow, change and become the people we ought to be. We actually help each other in our attempts to become more and more and more kind, loving, thoughtful, all of that while we're here on earth. Huh. You know, a lot of times we hear a lot. Of, I hear people say, you know, you're on this journey alone. You're on your this journey alone. But you don't believe that. You believe that actually our journey, part of our journey is to help others on their journey. Is that what you're exactly, saying? Exactly. Exactly. You got it. Boom. There it is. Good. That's Good. why I describe living on Earth as a human being in a human form as living in a social forest. There are forests on earth, all kinds of trees, plants, and all kinds of other organisms. Human beings, we live in community. We were created to live in community, much like forests on earth. And just like forests, there are big trees, there are low shrubs, and even there, there are things that we don't recognize crawling underground under the leaves. Wherever you are in that social forest, it's your responsibility to do what you ought to do, fulfill your mission, be where you ought to be, do what you ought to do, but that is all to help the whole forest survive. Hmm. The microbes can't survive without the big trees, and believe it or not, the big trees can't survive without the microbes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're all on that, 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 that circle of life, as they say, right? Well, yeah. No. Uh, fruitivity. That is one of the most unique titles for a book. And, and folks, you can find that book on Amazon or any online um, uh, place to, to purchase books. Amazon, probably the, the, the easiest one, but fruitivity Tell, tell me how you came up with that title. It just floated by one day when I was thinking about why human beings are on earth. We were assigned when we got here, when we were created. Sidestep. I, I do come from a Judeo-Christian mindset. That's obvious and, and evident in the title. We were told when we got here on earth to be fruitful and to multiply, to master the earth, to become 
commander of every all all every and all the other parts of creation. Fruitivity is a mashup. When you mash fruitfulness and productivity together, and they got to dance together, that's what I came up with. Fruitivity. Every time I hear that word, it sort of lodges in my head. I think it's uh, I'm I am a one who uh, appreciates creativity, and that's not that's not always made by well, my managers in the past all that happy, but um, I I appreciate that as as a writer, as a as a as a consultant, and um, I just I just love that title. And you know, one of the nice things about that title, in my, in my opinion, if I may. I think that fruitivity, in a sense, sets the, the reader's mind to, to determine what they believe fruitivity is until, of course, they climb inside the book. And I like that. I don't like giving away everything on the cover. I want people to scratch <laughs> their head and go, huh, I'm wondering what that means. And then go on their journey, go discover it. And, you know, Come on inside. I'll tell you about what it means. So um, kudos to you. I, I love, love the title, really. Thank you. All right. Now, you mentioned that you aim to help people avoid making certain mistakes in their career and life development caused by socially acceptable negative mindsets. Uh, help me unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about certain mindsets that have to do with the age process. Mm -hmm. According to William Bowles, in Three Boxes of Life, there are three boxes he describes that we jump into in life. We're either in the learning box, in the working box, or the retirement box. One of the other, one of the other. And we're supposed to be in one or other of these boxes at a certain age in life. So from maybe six years old till you graduate from high school, you're in the learning box. If you're age six to 19, you're supposed to be learning. If you're after that, 20 to 45, 50, you're supposed to be in any one of several stages of career growth. That's the career box. After age 65, and for me, it has pushed up to 70. You're supposed to be in the retirement box. This is the box where you're supposed to have fulfilled everything that you started out to fulfill in the career box. And now you're kicking back. The yeah. idea that this is how a lifetime is supposed to run is a socially accepted idea of what people in certain seasons of their life are supposed to be doing. And I'm saying, let's get rid of that. Right. Yeah, I'm hearing that. I'm hearing you're not a fan of boxes. Hey. <laughs> uh, well, you've got, you've, got a, you've got a fan over here too. Never been, never been a, a fan of boxes. Actually, when I was at Xerox, I remember one of the, uh, the photographers there, uh, I have to find that it's somewhere actually, uh, made a picture of me kind of coming out of a box, just my head. And uh, it was rather disconcerting. <laughs> but I used to I used to actually give it away in some of my seminars, telling people think out of the box. And it was a, a poster of my head, leaving a box. box. So uh, uh, I, I hear what you're saying there. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go after another intriguing question that you pose. And uh, it's a quote that I saw is what I do, who I am. Talk to me about that. Believe it or not, that's another of the socially accepted ideas that, that uh, are running around. As you grow up, what's the first thing people want to ask you? What do you want to be when you grow up? A child would answer, oh, I want to be a ballerina. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a firefighter so associated with what we do with our personality is that if we ever lose an occupation, the immediate response is, well, 
now that I'm not a firefighter, now that I'm not a policeman, I'm not doing anything. That means I'm not being anything. I'm not who I am. Who am I? Those questions come up. We associate what we do with who we are so closely that if we lose what we happen to be doing at the moment, that we also lose track of who we are. But who we, who, who we are goes further than what we do to make money or for a living or for somebody else. It has to do with the essential soul of the person, which may, and, and the other jobs may float by. We go in and we go out of those kinds of situations. It's another socially accepted misunderstanding that we live by and what causes job seekers. And we got a lot of them now. The pandemic has done that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned seasons. Yes. Um, for me, I, I was, um, I watched my parents, I particularly my dad. Um, really move into a much more charitable season of his life um, once he uh, retired, once he got near retirement. You know, he always was with the Lions Clubs. So I shouldn't say that. You know, I, he, he was a lion uh, for decades and decades, always collecting glasses. Uh, the, the Lions Club is big on helping people who, uh, who are blind or who, who struggle to see. Uh, so, but he really kicked into gear uh, in that final season and um, actually was in Florida running a, a consignment shop. There it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Rob, use your words. There it is. Consignment job. Uh, but just um, a, a lovely because they really were able to collect and, and turn things over to, to people who are needy. But thank goodness I got to see that and um, I'm kind of reminding myself to get a head start on that because it, it is, it's so important. And Edia, you know, while we struggle and like there's certain things we can't control, the mindset of employers sometimes, what they see instead of what they really need to see. And yet when it comes to giving and kindness and charity, we don't have to be dependent on anyone else. That's we right. be, we, we, that is one of the few things that's 100% in our control. So I've always appreciated that myself because my business as a speaker has gone up and down during the pandemic, but the other opportunities to help individuals that's really has not been as affected by the pandemic. There's always an opportunity to help another mm -hmm. human being pandemic pandemic. Yeah. There's always another There's opportunity always opportunities. Help. If you look and see them, yeah. if you're looking for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you also talk about being a good fit for a company. That's the goal for all of us. Mm. Give me some, give, give us some pointers to being a good fit for a company. Cause that's a rough one. And as you said, a lot of job seekers out there, and that's a passion of both of ours. Talk mm. to us about that. Right now, being the right fit for a company has more to do with a list, a wish list, if you want to call it, of features or skill sets or whatever that a company puts out on its job subscription, uh, description, prescription. That's another, that's another thing. <laughs> that's what you do after the job interview. That's, that's, you yeah. fill your prescription. I got you. You fill your prescription. Yeah. But a job description will include things like has to have this much knowledge for this many years in this subject has to be a person who can get up. They don't tell you this, get along with the rest of the staff that you're going to potentially join and a whole list of things that a company wants to see. But being a good fit for a company goes beyond that. Actually, let's say you're me. I believe in using your words. I was a third grade teacher. <laughs> I was a first grade teacher. I believe in encouraging students to use their words. I fight with words. I communicate with words. I go by thoughts. I put thoughts on paper. I'm the kind of person who would encourage people to not only use their words, 
but to use them to promote prevention from fighting. Now, what would it look like if I went to a corporation that essentially builds, promotes, advertises, and develops objects, things, or ideas that will essentially put together methods or ways to fight other people and to kill other people. Now that's gonna cause a bit of a disconcerting thing. Right. I am essentially a pacifist and I'm going to work in a place that builds weapons. Not good. So you wouldn't take that. That's a good question, Edia. Let's stay there just for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if if a gun manufacturer came from left field and said, Edia, I've got a job for you and I can I can double whatever it is that you're earning right now. Would you turn that job down? Yes, with the quickness. In a New York minute. Wow. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Do you know One that day, in the financial uh, yeah. industry, yeah. there are, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get this wrong. So go, go send ahead, me an email, go. folks, when I when I butcher this term up. But I, I you know, there, there are stocks and there are companies, cigarette companies, alcohol companies that produce alcohol, not terrible companies, but no. I re- think they were referred to as sin stocks or something along that line. And some of the mutual funds will actually bundle them together. And for those who really don't care. And want to turn a profit? There it is. That though they're they're not in a nice bundle. And there are others just like you, I would guess, who'd say, you know, I don't want to invest in um, a tobacco company right now that may be misleading the public. Uh, and, and it it falls into the same um, kind of thought pattern that you have. Is would you invest in a company that uh, that produced a product like a gun or a cigarette that you didn't believe in? You're absolutely right. You're on the right track. Yeah. I would not put my money into right. or use my words for yeah. because that's my flagship skill, words. Yeah. yeah. I would not do that for a corporation that produced cigarettes. Right. Or gun. Right. Uh, you know, I, I uh, as a as a professional speaker, I, I always uh, sort of drew a line in the sand and said, I'm not going to sales train a company that produces a product that I think is a you know a, a bad product, a rip off to the public. Why would I uh, become a mercenary and train that company how to do that? And I um, only once in my career did I really get pushed right to the wall on that. Mm -hmm. And it was a job that was offered by a speakers bureau to leave the uh, company and industry out of this. But I, I will tell you that I ended up, uh, it wasn't sales training as much as a keynote speech, but I ended up going there and speaking and uh, and I'll tell you why Mm -hmm. I, in my mind, I thought maybe I can deliver a presentation here that will inspire this company and this audience to do things in a different way that are that are better for the public. So uh, I, I, I always walked away and thought, Rob, you're on thin ice. And it is funny how the mind will begin to make excuses and go, wait a minute, I think I figured out a way of uh-huh. getting around. But I did. I, I, I decided I'm not going to sales train them. That's a little much. But you want an hour on a stage in front of about 500 people, I get to pick the message. I'm going to pick a message that might be able to help these people a little bit. And, but that's the closest I ever got to the line that you're describing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Tell me a couple lessons you learned somewhere in your journey that had the biggest impact on your career or even your life. Uh, One of the ones that I learned the hard way was that whereas money is a wonderful servant, opportunities open up when you have money. Places to go that will take you further and faster on a path that you're taking. Money is a wonderful servant. But on the other hand, it's an awful, cruel master. 
if you if if you're doing everything you do just to get the money you run after it as hard as you can it has this thing of always eluding you always just a step ahead number two there's always somebody out there who's prettier faster and better at what you're trying to do Comparing yourself to other people is the fastest way to unhappiness. That's lesson number two that I learned the hard way as I look in Facebook and all the other media outlets where the thing is, you must be able to be like this person. You must be able to smell like this person, make the money, make the bling, go to places. Comparing, comparing yourself to other people, fastest way to get the unhappiness. That was lesson number two. Yeah. And, and I think that lesson number two has been in the news lately because there's a lot of pushback on Pinterest. There's a lot of pushback on um, you know, Facebook uh, because they put people put up photos and images and stories of a life that is, uh, first of all, not being completely told. Mm -hmm. And um, one that is that is troubling for others that said that are saying I, I making that mistake that you're telling us to avoid, which is watch comparing yourself to others. You don't need to go to Pinterest and see people in Happyville, you know, with perfect <laughs> bodies and you know, and perfect meals. And um, I, you know what helped me with that a little bit, Edia, and, right. and for me as a writer, and we're two mm -hmm. writers. Uh, Sometimes when I write a piece, it helps me work out my thoughts, my issues. And I wrote a piece one time called Play the Ball, Not the Opponent. Mm, and what, mm. and what it reminded me, and it was, I'm a horrible golfer, but, <laughs> but what it reminded me was that um, I just need to focus on my shot, my ball, what I'm doing out on that course, my journey. Mm -hmm. And and the moment I lift my head up and start looking at the other guy's journey. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, yes. Let's know first what of all, I can't impact it in any way. It's not like if I look at it hard enough, the ball won't go straight. That's mm -hmm. their shot. And all mm -hmm. it's really doing is taking the focus off of what I'm trying to do. So mm -hmm. it's a perfect way to lose focus. And um, it's fool's gold. It doesn't work. So I really hope that that is um, nesting a little bit with people who are listening, because um, I, I just think I, I particularly for kids out there, they're so vulnerable to um, to this. You and I went to school. Yes. And, uh, you know, and uh, I was always looking to my right and left and I wasn't <laughs> the tallest kid and I wasn't uh, I was a little on the skinny side and. Um, and then I would compare myself and those were the, the tougher days. Once I got comfortable in my own skin, um, life became a lot easier and I was able to excel. So I'm glad you really brought that up. I, I think that's a, those are two great lessons. The, I don't want to lose that money one either. I, there's listen, <laughs> most people will, will say, when were you the happiest? When I didn't have money, <laughs> when I was just, you know, out there, uh, with my friends, we didn't have two nickels. And for some reason, we together. were really happy. Then I started mm -hmm. making money. And then for some reason, I needed to make more. And it became an obsession. And, you know, and the objects that, that begin to, uh, uh, we begin to attract to our money. And uh, two great lessons for people to remember. All right, let's go to you. How about, about a hurdle that you personally faced? Uh, and let's just go with well i'll take one or two but one or two hurdles that you faced and but more importantly how you over or as importantly how did you overcome them well one of the biggest ones that i could mention is getting the book written in yeah. the first place yeah there were all kinds of doubts that came from every direction saying number one who do you think you are to tell anybody anything because you're so messed up yourself? You're not good enough. You're not knowledgeable enough. You're not educated enough. You're no psychologist. What are you doing doing this? You're nothing. Nobody's going to listen to you. You're small and empty and tiny and worthy of being 
not only neglected, but ignored. That was the biggest one, the biggest hurdle I had to really attack. I'd had to make a frontal attack on that one. And it actually took me two years to get the book written. Two years to get it to get it written from when I first thought the, of the idea to the time that it went to publication. And all along the way, there was the same, same struggle. Who are you to say anything to anybody? You're nothing. You're on the bottom of the social scale. You're scum. Even as you're going through this, it's hard to hear that from me. Um, it's hard to hear you set, put all those words together. Um, tell me how you overcame that. Ah, the biggest breakthrough was when I actually began to believe. It was Thanksgiving. I was walking through Macy's, love Macy's. And in the middle of a display, all the turkeys and the straw and the bales of hay, I saw a wee card. And on the card, it said, you are who heaven created you to be. And that attached itself to my heart. I began to investigate the idea, who, who am I? There's this thing that the world says that I am. And then there's the thing that another force says that I am, that God says that I am. What are you going to believe? You're going to believe all the things that the world says. The rest of the world can only see you from the outside. They can make their opinions, but you have to always question. Is it the truth? Is this true? And one by one, I began to look at what was being said from the world about me and ask the question, is this true? Where did this come from? Let's examine this. Is this true? Let's turn this over on the underside. Does somebody have a purpose? Is somebody getting an advantage from saying this about me? I began to slowly come to terms with and believe that who God says I am is the truth because he always tells the truth. He is truth. I am who I am created to be. I am who he says that I am. And regardless of what the rest of the world says, I have to hang on to the truth. And little by little, my mind began to ignore certain kinds of messages about me that still prevail today. But I learned how to put up a mental shield against them to protect my own soul from being driven into depression or worse by these ideas that swirl around in the media and in other places about who they think I am. Uh, I am, I'm just sort of breathing and taking that in a little bit. Uh, I think that's really powerful. I also, I, if I could dovetail onto that, I want you to listen very carefully, process what you just heard from Edia. And I want you to understand that this voice that Edie is speaking about, it's a sneaky voice. Uh, it is mm -hmm. a very sneaky voice. It doesn't really come through the front door. It comes in through a side window. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is we begin to process negative thoughts and they start very harmless and they start slowly. And that's how they begin to creep in. They, 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 they almost start as a joke. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. oh, Rob, you could have done that, but, but you can barely find your way out of a paper bag. Yes, and, and that. we laugh and then, but they, but they keep going mm -hmm. and, 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 and they get a little more vicious if mm -hmm. you were smarter, you probably would have figured that out. And then they get a little more vicious. And pretty soon they 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 not only came through the window, they they opened themselves up a bedroom. They they're they're sleeping in that house of, of yes. that brain of yours. 
They they have <laughs> taken they have taken over that house. Yeah. They have keys. <laughs> they walk up and down the stairs and flush the toilets. <laughs> They're taking all the good food out of the refrigerator. Yes, <laughs> they're eating you up and drinking up your stuff and smoking your tobacco. <laughs> so one of the things for me, at least, is whenever I'm around another individual who I'm coaching or counseling, or even if I can be consciously aware for myself, I do not permit any joking, kidding, nothing. It's never funny to say something negative or think something negative about yourself because when you do, uh, you're letting those thoughts establish a foothold. That's not who we are. We're here to do the best we can. Each day we wake up we, and we try it again. Uh, we have the blessing of opening our eyes. Now let's try and do a little better today. And if we don't, that's okay. Because tomorrow we're going to work even harder to do better. But we can't let those thoughts, no matter how harmless people think they are, can't let those negative thoughts in. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, and sadly, you know, it's our voice that's doing it frequently. It's not the person across the street, you know, that bad manager might have kicked it open, Mm. but it's our voice that begins to fill in the gaps. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, Edia, I really enjoyed that. This conversation we can find, let me remind everybody, we can find fruitivity on Amazon and not only can we find fruitivity on Amazon, but uh, we can write a review when we buy that book on Amazon. Is it an ebook yet? Have you, did it come out as an ebook? Not yet, but that's in the works. Yeah, that's we got to give the them works. a push on that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, you'll see it. It's a really cool cover, um, a great title. And the best part is if you think you like the title and the cover, where do you crack open that book? I think listening to Edia talk for the last half hour, you get a sense of something very special, something very personal and, and, and spiritual. And um, I can tell you as a person who has read that book and I have, I've read it cover to cover and I don't read many of the books of the authors that I have on, but I've read (laughs) ideas. Well, I, I've looked through them rather quickly, but there's a lot of books, a lot of authors I'm talking to. But it is, I read cover to cover, and I can tell you, you won't be disappointed. Grab that book, finish it off, um, take some notes, and then write write a nice review, and uh, yes. you'll you'll have gone full circle for that. Edia, a writer by trade, a storyteller by heart. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Well, it's been my pleasure. And one more thing before I let you go. How do people uh, get a hold of you? If you're on LinkedIn, it's simple. You put my name into the search box on LinkedIn, and it will come up with Edia Stanford Bruce on LinkedIn. Uh, and if you, you'll also see the company near LinkedIn, my regular LinkedIn. You will also get into contact with my company page. I have a company page on LinkedIn. Perfect. Perfect. So you can learn more about Adia there, reach out on LinkedIn, and um, uh, and you will not be sorry. In any case, folks, listen, we'll do it again as well as we can next time. Until then, stay safe. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com.